Welcome, friends. So today we have um, two community leaders from um, African American community for the after in the context of um, George Floyd's murder. And in this painful tragedy, I think it is very difficult conversation, very painful conversation, but we are all grieving and we wanna to talk to these community leaders. I will let them introduce themselves first. Hey everybody, my name is uh, Michael Simpson. Um, I'm a community activist. I started a nonprofit, which is Capital Rebirth, that gives back to this community and try to help you know, our youth. Um, I met Dr. McGee working at PPR, working with youth. So that's just you know, something I'm into is working with kids and helping you know, progress the future. Hello, my name is Angel Green, and I am currently a clinical treatment supervisor at the Harrisburg Abraxas Student Academy, um, where I provide treatment and rehabilitation for adjudicated youth who are court-ordered to our program. They're involved with juvenile probation and uh, children and youth. How does racism and all these events that we are uh, repeatedly are traumatized with, how are these, uh, as well as your personal experiences, um, how do they affect you? Well, personally, um, it affects me just because I am a black man. So, you know, the same uh, situation that, you know, people across the nation are dealing with uh, being gunned down, you know, by policemen or, you know, for police brutality, that's something, you know, that is, is a reality for me every time I leave my house, you know, and it's scary, you know, because like I said, I have a daughter that, you know, who is starting to ask questions about these situations because this, uh, you know, death has brought so much attention nationwide. It's shown on every channel, every social network platform, um, and it's becoming a big topic, you know, for all ages, you know, and all backgrounds in our community. Um, so it, it's personal for me because it's something I have to live with every single day. Mm -hmm. I agree, um, Michael. Um, you know, Michael and I have known each other for quite some time at what me middle school, mm -hmm. <laughs> elementary school, maybe yeah. uh, all through high school and even in college. And we remain um, friends. Um, he's also friends with my husband, um, who's also a black man, and I'm a black woman, and we have black children. Um, and so we are not just watching it on TV, but we've experienced it um, for many years. Um, and then for me, um, before my current position um, in college, I, I had dreams of, at the time, becoming an African-American studies professor. So for me, watching this on TV is just history repeating itself over and over and over. And it's disheartening because, um, you know, in the age that I am in my mid-30s and then um, thinking about my youth that I service um, who are teenagers and who are um, a part of this law enforcement world because of the mis decisions that they have made. Uh, I won't call them mistakes just because they purposely made some poor decisions. Um, but for circumstances that are, you know, unknown to me, sometimes they are put in positions where they make these decisions and they're thrown into a criminal justice um, world where they are torn between following a legal authority and raging against the machine at this moment because um, they're on probation, they have ankle monitors on, so on and so forth, but they're made to listen to these probation officers. And it's kind of contradicting when they're looking at the news right now. And I'm having conversations with them about ways to um, utilize their probation officers as resources and healthy mentors. And they're like, no, they're killing us, <laughs> you know? So um, in my daily life and personal living, um, and also in my professional life, that which also always crosses back and forth because I love my students so much. Um, it's hard. It's really hard. And, that, and that's really all I can say about it right now. It's hard to deal with that day to day and see the confusion for a teenager or a young child to, and try to find an answer for them that we don't have for ourselves. And I think one key problem, like you mentioned, the very people we are supposed to go to seek help and protection to those kids' points, um, they're the ones who have been unfortunately repeatedly involved in these um, murders. 
So, mm-hmm. Michael, as a as a young man, if you were driving and a cop uh, car comes over, how how is your uh, experience? Or if you get pulled over, I don't know if you have experienced that. Mm-hmm. So that's actually happened to me. Um, but I'll be honest. Every single time I see a cop, whether I'm in the city, you know, in the suburb, the highway, I tense up. You can ask anybody in the car with me. I sit up. I put both hands on the wheel. You know, just I don't even want to, you know, entice them to even want to pull me over, you know, because I don't know what's going to happen. And I'm legit scared. Um, But I did have a situation where I was pulled over in the city um, when I first got back from college. uh, And I had a laptop, you know, that I had from college in my back seat. And he must have thought, you know, the officer must have thought I stole the laptop or, you know, because it was a MacBook, you know, so they're expensive. Um, but he actually took my MacBook and took it back to his patrol car. And I don't know what, you know, he did with it, or he ran, tested the serial number. I don't know, you know, but it's like, why? Why to go to that measure, you know, over a computer, you know, it's in my backseat, you know, and it had the University of Virginia on it because that's where I went to school and I bought it from my bookstore. And I simply went to my phone and I Googled my name, you know, and it, it showed up, you know, that I went to the university and I played football there. Um, so at that point, he was kind of dumbfounded and just kind of tossed my, my lap back, laptop back into my car and kind of walked off. And it's like, for what? And he had no legit reason to pull me over. I wasn't doing anything at all. I wasn't speeding, you know, it was on Fifth Street, you know, so it's a area where I know very well, you know, kids are running in and out, you know, the streets playing, whatever the case may be. So I'm never going to, you know, speed in that area. So he can't say, you know, I did nothing wrong. And he didn't say nothing was, you know, brought about. So I personally dealt with that, you know, one time in another situation where I was in college, actually, um, it was a heavy area, uh, like the party area where people go where the bars and restaurants are. And, you know, me and a friend of mine, a teammate who was black, we were driving and we seen a large group of black people, about 15, 20 people outside of a restaurant and a cop was behind us. And because the cop was profiling the group, you know, uh, standing outside a the restaurant, they ended up, you know, hitting us and rear ending us, um, you know, causing a car accident just because they were simply, you know, trying to figure out why these black people, you know, were gathered outside a restaurant, you know, they weren't doing anything. You, they clearly were just standing out there, you know, waiting for their food to be done. You know, and this is a college town, you know, so black people are there, you know, and they're not like out of town people. They're young college kids. So, you know, those are two situations that I dealt with personally in the car. And and that definitely, I think the, your experience um, and people of color could relate, most people of color could relate with that um, when a cop pulls over or even drives by or comes closer heart rate or the kind of that fear uh, or stress hormones go up. And a lot of these situations, if we look into the dynamic, the person who is pulled over or stopped, their adrenaline is already up based on all of these experiences. And the number of pulling people of color uh, or stopping them um, for for a reason or no reason, is significantly higher. Use the word profiling, and then even for the, there are several situations where even though they pull them over, but then there is a paranoia on the on the cops' parts, um, and then there. So both parties first they pull over the person's adrenaline and fear response is high, and then they're themselves in that paranoid state of somebody's going to attack us back. And then the whole situation is just escalated and repeated mm-hmm. over and over again. Um, so Angel, as a, as a black woman, have, do you worry for your husband or your kids in these situations on doing regular life things like driving or jogging? I actually do, but you know, um, I think that there's this, um, I don't want to call it a narrative, but I mean, there's this narrative going on and, and it's true that black men are dying at an alarming rate, but um, black women are most often subjected to a lot of, um, you know, aggression toward, from police officers, a lot of stereotypes, a lot of um, sexual windows. Um, there's this historical narrative that black women are, and black, young black women, um, young girls 
are um, highly sexually driven. And so, you know, there's a lot of inappropriate conversation, a lot of um, uncomfortable fares. I know for myself, um, working at Abraxas, we have, we um, tend to have children both in Dolphin and Cumberland County. Um, we reach out, I've worked, you know, everywhere from all over Dolphin County, all over Cumberland County, out in Carlisle. And in Carlisle, sometimes I've been, um, stereotyped and discriminated against the most um, out there um, to the point where in Dauphin County, oftentimes I would use my personal car to drive and see my, uh, my clients or check on my students, go from school to school, but I never would use my personal car in Kerlin County just for the simple fact that um, if I did get pulled over, if the license plate were run, they would run from my, and they would read my jobs um, information and not my own just so that any police officer will understand that I was a part of that, if you want to call law enforcement counseling round, um, and, it, and it saved me. Um, another thing would be with me going to uh, Carlisle um, most often and running into Confederate flags, and um, I've had um, even social workers over for, you know, for instance, like um, Kermelin County uh, Children and Youth. I've had social workers that would say, oh, we didn't think that you would look like you <laughs> when I would get to a client's house. Um, and, and, you know, some people might be enraged by that, um, you know, and I can't lie and say that it wasn't uh, upsetting at points, but um, it actually was empowering to me because it gave me an opportunity to show a different narrative. And I, and I like that you pointed out the picture of um, when you're being pulled over as a black person, you're nervous but so was the police officer. And I think that that narrative comes historically and from, you know, media, like there's this stigma of us being so vicious and so aggressive and so something to fear, you know, um, the whole clenching your purse and all that other stuff that they do when we come around. Um, and, it, and in the realm that I work in, the capacity that I work in, and, and Mike Hell, you know, working with different groups of people and, and engaging with a lot of people, it gives them an opportunity to look at us and say, okay, they're not what we thought. Um, some of the most um, challenging and rewarding times was when I was working in a different area other than Dawson County, where there were Confederate flags swinging everywhere. And I, my husband was actually terrified for me and actually like wow. fussing at me, like, you better leave from out of there. It's late at night. And I'm like, no, I need to make sure I do this family sessions with these families and really help them, um, you know, regardless of my, you know, my fear. Um, and by the end of it, you know, I was doing counseling sessions with people for six to six to nine, 12 months. And by the end of it all, they had a different outlook on me and hopefully a different outlook on African Americans in general. Um, you know, so it, it, it can be rewarding, but to answer your question is terrifying. It's terrifying um, to have to put your car in cruise control just so you can make sure you don't speed because you're afraid to uh, be pulled over. It is terrifying. So Angel, to piggyback off that, that is something I legit do too. Put my car on speed control yeah. in certain certain areas. And, and I want to touch on something that you said. It's like, we have to prove ourselves to eliminate a stereotype. But, you know, on the other end, when I meet, you know, different races, I don't say, oh, you have to prove yourself because I heard, you know, oh, this is what your race stands for. This is what your race mm -hmm. does. That's mm -hmm. just not, you know, the character that I, you know, I possess. And it shouldn't be like that for any race. I don't care what background you come from what you know religious background you have it shouldn't be a case where I have to prove that I'm actually a good person mm -hmm. you know for you to accept me you know because I'm accepting you I don't come in you know to your establishment or where you're at and say oh well I've heard this about your race can you prove that you're not the same people mm -hmm. so it's it's, it's 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 just you know it's heartbreaking definitely and this stereotyping is goes on the core of that discrimination and you're right that proving that discrimination has happened or somebody has carrying that judgment is so difficult, particularly even in the legal cases um, where a common person could easily see in the court of law, it's difficult to prove. But it is amazing that both of you uh, work across the races and uh, Angel, to, also to your example where um, even though you yourself were looked at differently or were seeing the symbols of oppression towards yourself or um, the historical symbols, and then you are still extending your compassion 
towards them. Mm -hmm. That is powerful. Um, now, do you, uh, looking at the history and where we are, what we are seeing, do you feel we are progressing? Is racism decreasing or increasing or is it the same? I'll let you go first, Angel. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, so, I mean, to be quite honest with you, I think that what is awesome about working with teenagers, and I don't know if it might help you feel the same, but um, there's something about this generation that um, they just kind of strip away with everything. And sometimes um, I, I agree with that. And sometimes I'm like, wait a minute, don't forget you guys history. Don't, don't lose um, track of self and your ancestry and, and the struggles and, and the triumphs that we have come over. Um, but oftentimes um, I look at them and there's, they just don't care. They don't care about um, the stereotype. They don't carry it on. They don't, put up these uh, these boundaries and these borders amongst each other. Now towards us as adults, they might kind of look, you know, as, as it relates to law enforcement and all that, they might look side eye and have their reservations, but from one to another, they're not, they're not, um, they're not dealing with that. But as a whole, um, I would say that we're taking baby steps to, towards progression, but every time that we take baby steps, there's something that kind of like catapults us back you know like so we were taking baby steps I remember um you know being on that campus of Norfolk State University which is a historically black college and um being excited when the elections came and, and our president or former president Obama was elected and I was happy and I cheered and we ran outside in our pajamas from our dorm and we cheered it was raining and we played music and we cried and we hugged and then we took a, a bus to watch his inauguration and it was freezing cold and I cried because I saw uh, people, elderly people that, you know, should not have been out in the cold, but they refused to leave because they just had to see that moment. Um, and it was awesome. And the only thing I can remember is while if my grandmother was alive, like what would she feel and how would she, you know, like what would she be thinking to see such a beautiful moment? And then I fast forward to um, the current president that we have now and I'm like, wow, just that fast, we have gone backwards. Um, and now I'm afraid. <laughs> you know, So uh, I think that we do, we really, and I think that that's because we ultimately want to do better. I think we want to do better, black, white, and different. We want to do better. We want to embrace each other. Um, we are scared all together. Um, and we are upset. And, and you know, we, we want to do better. But then there's this, um, this dark cloud. Um, and I think that a lot of it comes from people trying to pretend like things of the past don't matter, um, that, uh, you know, we don't still have the stain of slavery still lingering over us, the, the um, um, you know, Jim Crow and segregation was not mm -hmm. that long ago, um, and people try to ignore instead of just acknowledging it and, and, and you know, working together to continue to push forward, um, but every time I'm sorry, but every time I, I watch the president speak, it just really feel. I just feel like we're being pushed back further and further. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, did you want to say something, G? Mm -hmm. oh. No, go go so, for it. I think so uh, uh, that's a great point. I'll come back to it after after you. Okay. So, so to me, it, it's it's hard to gauge. You know, if we're making progress, to be honest with you, um, but I will say this. You know, me and Angel went to Harrisburg High School. You know, during that time, it was probably about 80, 90 percent, you know, minorities, mm -hmm. you know. And now it's so many, you know, different races and backgrounds, you know, in our school. So these kids are getting to interact with different races at an earlier age. You know, like my first time I was exposed to racism pretty much was uh, going into my junior year in high school when we played 707 at Penn State. Uh, we went up there and we stayed the night, you know, in the dorms. And I remember at night, you know, a couple guys that was, you know, we went out, just, you know, get some fresh air, walk around the campus and, you know, see what Penn State was about. That was my first time up there. You know, they were actually recruiting me for football at that time. And all I can remember was, you know, people yelling from dorms, niggers, niggers. And it's like, wow, is this real? And, and I remember I got home, you know, and I called Penn State and I said, please, you can stop recruiting me. Now, I, you know, I know this, I know racists exist, you know, all over, but to see it firsthand, and that was, you know, the first time I really was exposed to it, 
you know, it, it, it was eye opening for me. Um, and it made me aware that racism is real, you know, because growing up in Harrisburg, you know, we're all, you know, we're all around each other. Even if, you know, there was a white friend around, you know, we accepted him because he lived in our neighborhood. You know, if it was mm -hmm. a Spanish kid, we accepted him because he lived in our neighborhood. So we didn't see like the tension, you know, but when we stepped up Penn State, you know, we saw that and I got to experience that. It was real eye opening to me. So, you know, and that was years ago, but like I said, I don't know if we're making progress um, until we start to get, you know, people, um, not just of color, people who have, you know, the mindset that everyone deserves equality in positions of change. And I'm not saying, you know, we have the clean house, you know, our city council and, you know, uh, state representatives and policemen, they all have to be minorities. That's not the case. We just have to have people who believe in everybody, you know, so, until that happens, I don't think we're going to make progress, you know, because there are still some people in these positions of power and authority who abuse it, you know, and mistreat minorities. So until that is broken, I don't think we can say we're making progress. And that's just my personal opinion. You know, now conversations like these, you know, and conversations that people are starting to have, and they're very uncomfortable, you know, for mm -hmm. me, uncomfortable, Absolutely. you know, for, for the viewers and the listeners, you know, and people who are actually in tune to these conversations. It's uncomfortable, you know, because we're admitting things that are blatantly happening in front of us and we know they're wrong. We know they're, you know, we're being mistreated. And it's hard for people to acknowledge that, you know, for whatever reasons, you know, stereotypes. I don't know what the case may be. Like I said, we were born to love. Hate is taught. You know, Majid, yes. you, work, you work with me. You know, you've seen kids calling me the N-word, you know. And I don't take that personal because that's something that you were taught. You know, so I don't blame you for that, you know, but when you call me that, I don't take offense, but I want you to understand that is wrong what you're saying, you know, and, and that hurts, Absolutely. but I'm not, but I'm not going to feed into your stereotype and have a negative reaction and allow, you know, myself to live up to whatever negative stereotypes that you possess, because then it's like, you're controlling me, you're winning, and that's not going to happen. You know, mm -hmm. words would never hurt me at all. And and that is where I think, Michael, you are also a um, highly resilient person and um, in many ways have uh, compassion and kindness and also training later in your years to even work with the youth and um, in the clinical settings, other work. But we can't hold everybody to the same um, expectations that once you like in that one word, one one n word or other these racially charged words, the person who is saying it is is bringing up so much and is in a way saying somehow we are lesser of human being. Um, mm -hmm. In in and there is all all of these references so. Um, so these experiences, I, I think the way you took is great. We, are, we wish everybody can um, rise above that, but I think one, it's not realistic because we are going to have a range of people. Second, even on our good days, we might be able to handle it, but let's say we are having already a vulnerable day and then mm -hmm. that gets triggered, we might react. Um, on the Question of uh, progress, I think that's a difficult one. I agree that um, particularly as we are faced with these situations, but uh, I do think in my, in my opinion, um, I think uh, to Angel, your point where you mentioned if your grandma knew uh, when um, Obama got elected, um, where in her generation, she didn't probably get to vote. Mm -hmm. um, and now um, we reached that point. And yes, I, I think that's where I do feel hope that, uh, yes, without, without in any way minimizing the current um, back steps, the harsh reality that we are seeing, uh, and we need to change it. Um, but I do think that the path of progress is not a straight line, it's a zigzag. And sometimes, mm -hmm. yes, we reach the low point where we reached now, but hopefully, um, and in a few minutes, we'll move towards the, what do we think 
um, would help us get back up. Um, and, uh, but another thing that makes us feel uh, this is um, also not progress is because we are identifying more. These events and these um, senseless killings were happening before as well, mm -hmm. but um, nobody captured it. A lot of these things were just remained hidden. And with uh, some of these uh, cameras, as well as hopefully we get more um, strict regulations for the body cam and the dash cam um, monitoring without control of the voice or without control in anybody's uh, being able to turn it off or on. I think as we do more, we will we definitely want to miss less. But partly, I do think that it feels um, more because we are identifying more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but I, I think the other thing um, is the also on the abraxas and or this juvenile detention center and um, the way system has been piled against uh, minorities and the racial segregation, even though uh, it's not legal anymore, but the, we're still living that where the school district or the educational opportunities, uh, all of those are divided over centuries. And right now we are still uh, not, so the track, uh, the choices that those kids make leading to the detention center, part of that is the opportunities, are they're not getting as much uh, opportunities or training and systemic level. Yes, uh, we wanna teach them accountability, but also we wanna address the systemic issues. And then also they get pulled over more. Um, the likelihood of them getting to the detention center is more than their counterpart uh, from the uh, white race. So what are, uh, what do you feel um, would help solve the situation? Uh, first, um, I would say conversations. Um, you know, I, I get that, you know, unless you're a minority, you can never understand, you know, exactly what minorities face day in and day out. But a conversation, you know, example like this, it can hopefully bring some light on what, you know, we have to face, you know, as Black people in America. Um, and secondly, you know, today is, you know, election or voting. This is, you know, where our voices can be heard and, you know, we can actually have an impact in the polls. And, you know, one thing I, you know, I, I, I wish our people would, would remove this is our votes don't matter. You know, I'm not voting, you know, because it doesn't matter. And, and I think they're wrong in that case. And, and that's why a lot of change that we want don't occur because we're missing, you know, example, if we have, you know, 20,000 minorities in the city of Harrisburg, but only 5,000 vote, you know, how is our voice being heard? How are the things that, you know, we want to see or, you know, reflect our community? How is that going to get, you know, imported into whatever system it is uh, that's been oppressing us for so many years or holding us back or mistreating us? So I think voting is key. Conversation is key. And getting people in positions that actually, like I said earlier, you know, care about all kinds of people, not, you know, just one race or not just for a political hidden agenda where, you know, they'll benefit or, you know, their kinds of benefit. You have to go in those positions, especially the political, with the agenda that I want to improve every single human's life, no matter what the race is, no matter, you know, where you fall on the financial scale, what level of education you have, you know, if you see, you know, they're lacking in these areas, that's where these political figures should step in and try to bring them up. Um, you know, and, and the big thing I'm strong on, um, and you can I advocate it a lot, is our fight back against br police brutality. Start encouraging, you know, our kind to police our communities. You know, at the end of the day, I will feel more comfortable being approached by an officer from my community that knows me, you know, or knows the environment I come in or, you know, our culture in not approaching me scared or, you know, having fear. And those situations can, you know, change a lot with the outcome. You know, 
I can have a simple conversation with somebody, you know, pulls me over who understands me or understands where I'm going, as opposed to where just give me your laptop, let me run it, let me see, you know, if you stole this laptop or not. Mm -hmm. If you know me, you know I went to college. I've never been arrested at all in this community. You know what I mean? So it's like we need people to police our, our own community. And like I said, it's not just all black people that need to police it. There are, you know, different races that actually, you know, understand this because, you know, this environment in this community, because there are other races in this community, you know, that are living in the same exact community, breathing the same exact air, doing what we're doing. If they can understand, you know, have empathy and, you know, be equal across the board, they get in those positions because, you know, the distrust is, is, is there for the police officer. We don't trust them because of how things have been handled. Um, you know, you can look at countless examples where unarmed minorities are gunned down when you see, you know, a white person who actually just, you know, committed murder or, or you know, uh, killed a bunch of people and they're given water bottles, you know, they're taking in, putting, you know, bulletproof vests on them, you know, it's like protecting them. It's like, what's the difference? My life is just as important as their life. Their, the crime that they committed is the same crime, you know, another person committed, but it's treated differently. So, you know, I, I really believe in, you know, getting people in position of powers that can, you know, influence change across the board. Voting and conversation is most important to me. Mm -hmm. And I, and I add to that, I think for me, um, the main thing that I like to focus in on is representation. Um, representation for me is key in all areas. I think that we have this, um, this, uh, this push on our young people that's always been there, you know, um, African Americans, black people, we always, um, you know, push hard, we excel um, in, in a lot of different areas, but, um, you know, people focused our areas on music and sports and, you know, that, that stereotypical space. And, you know, I was a student athlete. Um, my was a student athlete, and we both understand that um, sports and athleticism can take you far. It can, you know, scholarships and just the standard of um, character building, you know, being on time and having good work, great work ethic. That's wonderful. But there's, there's this large piece that's missing where our young people, um, not just our young people, but people in general are not seeing enough of um, black people in different spaces. And I learned that when I went to college and I went to college down in um, the Tidewater um, area, North of Virginia. Um, and I've always been here in Harrisburg uh, looking and seeing and realizing that, um, you know, Harrisburg is pretty small. Um, but there's this thing where if you are successful, we automatically, you know, think that those people are white, you know, well, that's a nice house. That's that, you know, some white person lives there. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of our kids think that, um, because Harrisburg is a small, the area is, just, you know, dense. And when I went to college, there were several areas where the houses were just beautiful, um, you know, and you just knew, you just knew. And then you were shocked because the people that came out of those houses were, professors and doctors and lawyers and they look just like me um and it changed my whole mentality um you know um lucky for me you know I was raised by a single parent my mom had me she uh, um graduated from John Harris and she had me when she was a teenager um and she but she had a different a different path for me you know um her her thing was you're not going to be what everyone expects of you or what they think of you you're going to be who I'm grooming you to be, and that's awesome. And you know, I give all credit to my mom because um, she had a bigger picture for me, and it, it expanded. And her picture for me expanded when I went to college, and then when I came back to Harrisburg, that was always my push for our young people. Um, you know, this horrible saying that my kids say, "Oh, you talk like you're white." <laughs> <laughs> this idea of um, you know black people not being professional, and I'm constantly fussing at them. Um, you know. And letting them know that there's nothing wrong, which is where the represent, representation comes in. There's nothing wrong with slang. There's nothing wrong with um, using your own vernacular that you have in your city and in your houses and your homes. But it's a problem when you don't know how to turn it off and turn it on. It's no different than someone else speaking a different dialect. You know, if you're Asian descent or Hispanic descent. And we have our own way of talking. And I explain that to them. But this is something that they don't see on a regular because typically their teachers don't look like me. Um, typically their counselors don't look like me. Um, when I'm going into the community and I knock on someone's door who has 
close their door, not open the door, not answer the phone for children and youth and, you know, probation and so on and so forth. And they will not engage with these people. And then I get to the house and it's like, oh, oh, I know you. I know your mom. I know, you know, you know. And so they're willing to engage with me, not only because I look like them, but because I am from the community. And that's what Michael is saying, like being from the community and servicing your community is so big. Um, and I, as it relates, and I just want to go back to what you were saying, um, doctor, at one point in time, you made mention to this, um, this, this space where um, our kids are, you know, suspended more, and they're arrested more, and they're, you know, they're, they're not on a, 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 a equal playing field. And that, again, goes to representation. There, are some, there were some times in my job when I first got there, when I started working for Braxis, where I struggled with the idea of seeing my young people in handcuffs, um, seeing them, you know, on house arrest or, you know, hearing their outcries. Oh, it's the summertime and I've been on house arrest for a whole summer and it's not fair. And, and in my heart of hearts, I knew some of these some of these probation officers were not doing them justice and they were not getting a fair um, shake like the, the ones over in Cumberland County where I would go in Cumberland County and a kid that stole something would get a slap on a community service or something. And our kid was, you know, placed on probation, but representation is key. And instead of me saying, I can't do this, I realized then that I have to be an advocate for those kids. And not only am I an advocate for those kids, but I'm also a translator for the law enforcement side. So when we have law enforcement that they want to do good, they want to help these kids, they want, because we have a lot of wonderful probation officers in Dolphin County, um, and they don't, they're not from this area, and they don't look like our kids, but they want to do good, and I'm able to bridge the gap between the two. I'm able to say, well, mom, you know, probation such and such is just looking to connect with you and help you out, and she's more willing to hear it from me or more willing to talk to that probation officer because I'm there with them. Um, that's my my job in that space to just bridge the gap. And we can't do that if we don't have more of us in those spaces. And uh, I agree with Michael when it comes to, um, you know, us doesn't necessarily have to be black people, but it does have to be people that are from this community. Um, it just gives our kids less of an excuse to not be successful. Um, because another thing is that, you know, when you tell, when I tell my young people, like, this is my story, this is my family story, you know, this is what I grew up like, they're stunned because they don't have an excuse anymore. You know, if I could do it, you can do it too. And if I can look this person in the eye and I can shake this person's hand and I can say, I'm going to show you different than what you expect of me, I'm going to teach you and role model it for you, then you're going to do it too. You know, um, so I think that to me is the biggest thing. I think that the representation and the role modeling brings everything else because when I vote, I take my students with me. Um, you know, I show them pictures of it. You know, um, when, when I have, when I bring my speakers, you know, Michael or any other speakers that I have in the community, um, you know, people that are trying to do right by our community, I bring them in. I'm not always the one that's doing the talking. I bring them in to my young people and that is because I want them to hear it, but I also want them to see it because once they go back home, they can then say when they go to the mall or the grocery store, hey, that's Mr. Simpson. He, he came and he talked to us and, you know, and, and they can hold them accountable when I'm not around, you know, and, and, it, and it's good when we uplift each other because that gives us the self-confidence. So when other people are looking down on us or stereotyping us or making us feel like we're less than, we're like, no, I already it's built in me. I don't have to worry about what you're saying. I know who I am and I know who I'm going to be. So you have that charge against the oppression. And um, so I think the conversations, representation, um, keeping um, for the youth and for other um, people of color in the community, for them to keep trying, keep uh, representing themselves, and also getting on the variety of jobs as well as work across the spectrum. Um, and I think the other thing is, these are the things that um, Black community should do in these cases. Um, and for Martin Luther King's quote, for evil to succeed, all it needs is for good men to do nothing. Or, mm -hmm. So the silence, I think, for across the races, 
that is quite lethal. And and yes, the people who um, are in the position of power and are not doing that hurts. But when other people, millions of people who we hope they would be the moral compass, even if they're not from the community, um, that role of moral compass from a white person when they see something, say something on um, and stop that person, have that courage to say, no, this is wrong, rather than just sticking to the party or the politics of it. And that, mm-hmm. that probably um, is needed across the races. Um, and uh, I think the other thing also, I feel this uh, at this point, a lot of attention in the media or, or otherwise went into the, for, for um, this unfortunate event for George Floyd uh, the attention is going towards looting and the negative events. I don't think that's the main thing to focus on. Yes, that we all agree that needs to stop and we need to stop that and we need to figure out every way. But in many ways, that's a branch issue or a symptom. That's not a root problem. And we need to reach out to have these dialogues and conversations and that the branch or symptom issues would settle down quickly themselves rather than making them those issues to be the center part of the conversation. Um, so anything as we are as we are wrapping things up, anything else that you would, um, uh, of course, we need to have these conversations. And I think, Michael, you mentioned that these conversations are not going to be easy mm-hmm. on all ends. And I also want to say to uh, people who are, um, from different races and communities, it's not one person's job to be the spokesperson or the person who is uh, next to you. If they don't want to have conversation, it's not their duty to teach us. It's Mm -hmm. our duty to go and learn. So uh, finding more um, avenues and places, of course, for our uh, people like uh, Michael and Angel, Angel or other community leaders reaching out yourself and educating ourselves um, on these issues is the key. Um, but I would let you guys do the concluding discussion. I know we went into the solution uh, focus, but is there anything else that you would like to leave the viewers? So, so for me, I would just want to leave with you know, parents start having conversations with your children. Like example, you know, Dr. Majid, I work with you, you, you've seen you, you know, younger kids call me the N-word. That's passed down from parents. Um, like I said, I have an eight-year-old daughter. Um, and with all this going on, uh, she sees it. And this is the first time she's, you know, she begin to ask questions about racism. Um, and she knows I'm a black man. And it's, it was heartbreaking this past weekend when she mentioned, I'm scared for you, dad, you know, I need to protect you, are you safe? Instead of me playing that role and saying, baby, I'm protecting you, she's worried about me, you know? And she has a little TikTok page, you know, which I monitor, of course, but she changed her profile on her own to the Black Lives Matter symbol, you know? And she's asking questions, dad, why did that cop do that to that guy? He wasn't doing anything, you know? He wasn't fighting back, he wasn't hitting the cops, he wasn't doing anything. Why did that cop have his knee in his neck for so long? So these you know, conversations are uncomfortable as a parent, you know, and I am, you know, like I said, I'm a black man. So I know it's uncomfortable, you know, for other races to have these conversations. And, you know, it, it's, it's scary when your eight year old daughter is more concerned about your life than I'm concerned about, you know, things with her scraping her knee, you know, simple things. She's worried about whether I'm going to come home or, you know, be alive. Um, and like I said, my, my father's white, you know, my mom's black. I've never seen racism in my house. You know, my dad never viewed me different. My mom never viewed, like, you know, so I didn't, I'm so blind to racism, like I said, until I got older when I first started experiencing it, you know, and and now to see it coming into the kids and these are going to be our next leaders. So if we want racism to, you know, end at some point, we have to start talking to the next generation. You know, those conversations have to happen. Um, And these kids, they're, they're growing up different than us. We didn't have social networks, like you said, where, 
you know, police brutality was hidden. Now it's on full fledged display. So now, you know, these questions that we may have asked as kids because we didn't see it, but now these kids are actually seeing it all over the news, all over social network. And their friends are starting to have these conversations. And that's the last thing you want is, you know, the kids to start having conversations among themselves with no understanding or guidance from parents. And now they start to create hatred for whatever race or whatever situation that they see. And that's the last thing I want, you know, okay, for example, I hope my daughter doesn't go, but she may, you know, develop hatred for white people, you know, just off of a simple video or, you know, continuous and see the mistreat of blacks. And that's the last thing I want, you know, so I, I continue to talk to my daughter about these things and I encourage all parents to talk to their kids about these things. I agree with what you're saying, Michael, and I think that I'd like to end on the idea of um, just being a change that you want to see. Um, I think that um, it was it was funny because um, today I was on my way to vote and, you know, I looked on Facebook and there was a young lady on Facebook. She's a white, white woman. And um, I haven't seen or remember anything about her. We actually, at one point in time, I, I went to school, elementary school in the um, Central Dolphin, Central Dolphin East School District area. And uh, the school population, as far as the students, were very diverse. But the staff, they, they weren't diverse at all. And the area is a really weird area because they have this um, like invisible line where they have like this housing area that enters into this school district, but then the line kind of splits when it comes to kids go to East or kids go to Central Dolphin. And it's like real funny, but we all know why the line is drawn like that. Um, but at this one particular moment, um, you know, when I was in about, I think, fifth or sixth grade, uh, I had my very first little boyfriend and he was white. Mm -hmm. And um, um, it's funny because I forgot all about this moment, but this young lady wrote about this moment on Facebook. Um, she's white and she's she's grown now and her husband, she has a husband and she has three beautiful children. And she wrote about the moment when, um, you know, my white boyfriend and I wanted to go to the school dance and his parents would not allow him to go to the dance with me because I was black. Um, I was hiding that I had a boyfriend because I wasn't allowed to have a boyfriend <laughs> at this time. He was hiding from his mom that he had a girlfriend because I was black. And I didn't remember the specifics of the situation until she brought it out. But that was the first time that I had ever experienced any form of racism and what she remembered was that my mom who was a very spunky feisty woman mm -hmm. um marched me into that classroom with my boyfriend and made me give him a hug in front of everybody um because he was heartbroken that he couldn't take me to the dance and he cried on the phone and I cried to my mom even though I had to tell her at the time that I snuck and had a boyfriend mm -hmm. um but what she did in that moment to empower me, what my mom did to empower me to let everybody know, like my daughter's going to love who she wants to love, you know, in that love type of way back then, um, actually taught the other students in that class. And it was amazing to see that Facebook post that that woman put up today. Now we're in our mid thirties and that happened when we were in like the fifth or sixth grade. And she remembered every detail of that and spoke about that detail and spoke about my mom's charge on um this idea of you know her daughter wasn't good enough and how she made how my mother made everybody else feel good about who they like and it so happened that that young lady who was white was actually dating a black boy at that time and uh in that post the black young man came and said yeah because your mom used to fuss at me about being on the phone with you and um you know her mom used to call you know her grandma i mean used to call him all sorts of names and everything and in that moment when my mom marched me in that school to make that statement, she felt confident to tell her grandmother, don't talk to my boyfriend like this. So the, um, the idea of just being the change that you want to see is, is it prevalent. You know, you have to stand up. And even if it's somebody that you think that, you know, you might have um, some type of repercussions from, you know, whether it be your employer or whatever the case, you know, you could professionally let people know how you feel and what's right because character is everything. Um, and I think that people are standing behind, um, you know, fears or hiding behind fears. And now we're trying to um, hide the, this, um, this outcry of hurt um, behind the looting and the rioting. And there's so much propaganda about people, you know, uh, white supremacists coming and do the looting and all this confusion. 
when the underlying issue is just that this has been happening for so many years and people are crying and they're hurting and we need to make real change. Um, so like, like Michael said, you know, it's, it's happening, you know, whether we want it to happen or not, as far as, you know, the negative aspects, but the negative aspects, as usual, will not overtake the, the, the positive portions of us all coming together and standing together. And I'm seeing police officers that are are coming out and are saying that we, we are not like them and we don't want to be like them and we will not be like them. And I think that more and more that we have that type of energy um, where people are not afraid to say, hey, this is how it's going to be because this is how it's supposed to be, then the better it will be. Mm -hmm. Powerful. Um, I thought this would be concluding, but one, one last question, um, and I, I will give my concluding <laughs> comment as well. When a white person reaches out to you under these circumstances, um, how does it feel um, reaching out to you uh, with the uh, message of compassion and saying that what is happening is wrong? How does it feel to you? So um, actually last night, I, I was on a Zoom call with uh, Bishop McDevitt's football coaches and football players. Um, their head coach reached out to me um, and he said, you know, I like your stance on, you know, what you tweet about and, you know, your beliefs on how everything should be equal. And, you know, we need to get into votings and get people in position, you know, that reflect us, you know. So I spoke to his team last night um, and I was actually excited that he reached out to me because, like I said, this was a chance where a conversation can be had, you know, with so many different walks of life. Like, you know, if you know McDevitt, it's a Catholic school, um, you know, it's probably split, you know, on our football team, half minorities, you know, half whites. So, you know, just to see, the, you know, the, the other races in that conversation listening to me and taking heed to what I'm saying and, you know, not trying to question, oh, why do you believe this? Or, you know, I don't understand this. Um, and the biggest thing that, that happened last night was pretty much their entire team um, tweeted about it, you know, how yeah. things need to be equal and fair. And that quote that you said, be the change, that's mm -hmm. McDevitt's mo uh, uh, motto for this season. You know, their oh, hashtag, well. that's their hashtag, you know, so if you go on my Twitter, you'll see me, I, I'm joining their movement as well, you know, mm -hmm. and, and it's great to see these players and it's, you know, a lot of white players on that team who are stepping up, you know, because they have black teammates, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and sports is a world where we don't see race, you know, we're all coming together from all different backgrounds, you know, mm -hmm. whatever the case may be, and we all have one common goal, you know, and that's to be successful and win games, you know, and enjoy each other's company, like, Playing sports and that brotherhood, man, it, it, it's amazing feeling. And if, you know, society can mock that, you know, we're, that goal where we all just come together for one common goal and that's the betterment of all. Um, I think that's something that is great. Like I said, I'm glad, you know, I don't care what race you are, what background. If you reach out to me, you just want to have a conversation of understanding, you know, and not challenge me, I am open for it. And, and you know, I welcome it. Mm -hmm. I think that um, for me, um, the, in the moments where I'm seeing people that are, you know, of, of different races, you know, reach out and, um, you know, give olive branches or, you know, just say, hey, are you okay? Or how's it going? Or how are you feeling? Or, um, you know, allowing us to feel how we want to feel because you can't really dictate how people of color should feel right now. Um, I think it's, it's a wonderful thing. But um, speaking personally, um, I was so overwhelmed with everything that was going on and just being transparent. I was, you know, I was angry. I was upset. You know, there's so many things going on in my mind. Um, and uh, the building in which I work in is actually on Front Street. Um, and it's not too far from the Capitol. Um, and again, in the setting that I work in, it, it's, it's, a, it's a hard situation because a lot of our kids are going to end up or have come from, um, you know, a, a secure detention center. Um, and they are um, housed in that detention center with a lot of people who don't look like them. And many of them don't care for our young people. They just want a job, you know? Um, and so sometimes I question it. And I told you that before, like I question it. And so in that moment when everything was going on, I was so heartbroken, um, you know, and it was Sunday and, you know, I attended my virtual church service and it just wasn't enough. I still needed something. So I actually went to my job and I walked around my job and I went into my office and sat down and I looked on uh, the wall at my office where we had taken a picture from last summer. Um, the school that I work at, um, we, we um, are in session all year round. So our, our students don't get 
a summer break or anything like that. They have a lot of credit recovery. They have a lot of catching up to do um, for different reasons. So we're in school all year round. But in the summer, we still like to do fun stuff. And last summer, we took the kids to Little Buffalo. And teachers that don't look like them were in the pool. And they and, and their older teachers, you know, some of the, like our older um, I, I, IEP teacher, she's, she's, um, quite, you know, older in age, and man, she was running around and just having mm -hmm. a ball, and our students were having fun, and in and, and that moment, no one even thought about any type of differences. We were just having fun, and, you know, having popsicles, and just laughing, and joking, and, and the students were enjoying themselves, and um, we were in a space where our young people, of course, you know, they're in, like, you know, swimming trunks, and, you know, um, dress, you know, an appropriate bathing attire um, for a school function, but they do have ankle monitors on, and so there were moments when uh, the other people that were patronizing the, the pool were staring at them and kind of looking and, you know, whatever. But our kids in that moment didn't pay it any mind. They were just having fun. So when I was in a building and I was in tears already, um, but I look at that picture and everybody was smiling in that picture. And I sent the email to all my coworkers, everyone, from the woman at the front desk to my um, director and I just poured my heart out to them and, you know, talked about, you know, some of my, um, my uh, fears for our students and some of my um, disappointments with some of the people that we interact with in different counties and things. And I just, you know, it was pretty late when I sent it. And, um, you know, I just had to get it off my chest. And then Monday morning, um, I got responses from just about every uh, coworker of mine. Um, they called me, they cried to me on the phone. You know, um, they pushed and they said, you know, we want to we want to make sure our kids, you know, like they they were so charged up and it was wonderful because it just set my heart at ease because it reminded me that I'm at the right place. I, I'm, I'm working with the right people um, and we're going to do right by our students regardless. You know, some of our some of our students, um, you know, they, they don't like school. <laughs> they don't like school. They don't have a value education. A lot of our young people's parents did not even graduate or make it past the eighth grade. So they are not instilled to have this great, you know, love for education. And sometimes they're very disrespectful and rude to our teachers. Um, and our teachers, and, you know, they, they still, they don't give up. They don't give up. And they want the best for these kids. And, and that email response just reminded me of that. And I, nothing else felt bad. Like, I just felt great because, um, you know, again, it reminded me that I am where I belong, you know, and we're fighting that good fight for our students. Awesome. Thank you so much to both of you, Michael and Angel, um, for this very heartfelt conversation. You guys uh, um, speaking about some of your fears, some of your vulnerabilities, sharing that, and also looking at the solutions. Um, I um, so thankful to you for talking to me. Thank uh, you for inviting us. Audience, thank you, thank you. And uh, I think that the concluding um, comment that I would like to um, summarize um, that in the end, we are all humans. We, are all, we all bleed the same. We are all same. And these colors, skin colors, all those things, they do not define the person's character or who they are. You just heard how um, a, a law-abiding um, person doing everything right is in, a, in that state of fear from the people they should be seeking protection from, um, and that is the reality, and we need to change it. The trauma that has been getting passed on to the generations, um, we need to stop it. Yes, we see some progress, and we have a long way to go, and um, like Michael mentioned, his daughter's worries. Now, that's the next generation thing. Um, Angel mentioned um, her experience in her teenage years. So as we are moving forward and, and making this uh, planet better place for a future generation, we need to get rid of the hate. And it comes, as, it comes disguised. Um, and there are going to be fears when you will speak up against that 
but you have to do it. Um, and um, that will make our, our planet better. Right now, we are already living in one pandemic of coronavirus, and I think this other pandemic of racism and hate is man-made. It is caused by all of these divisiveness within us, and we are all looking towards unity. And each one of you who is listening or watching, um, reach out to the person. That comment that every, uh, both of them made as well, that reaching out or just expressing your, um, your joining or your, your solidarity or your, you saying the wrong thing is wrong, that in itself is so soothing um, that it, it kind of uh, allows us to move past that. And I, I, um, I would emphasize that role of all of us speaking up. Um, and I, I would say the race, for race, um, uh, color blindness uh, is uh, not enough. Um, we, you can't be race neutral. You have to be anti-racism. Mm -hmm. And I would, uh, I value uh, what uh, Martin Luther King Jr. said again, the other quote that I love in the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much.